So this is going to be session one of, I'm just going to, a series or a class that we're going to, it's not going to be a life school thing we teach in Africa, but just we're going to put on our website called Ecclesia, Expressing Christ's Life Together. And I tell you what, my, you know, I've been a, following the Lord for 25 plus years, but just, just even recently, just wrote a book, 300 page book on God's eternal purpose. Just recently, God has just opened my eyes to a deeper level of what the church is meant to be. And it's beautiful. It has so blessed me. And I, I just hope this will bless you. So I want us to look in our Bibles in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. And I'm going to, I'm not going to read it verse by verse because I want to read it in a way that will help us see a little bit what I believe Paul's main thrust is in this. Because what happens is, what I've found is, if you read it just as it says it, you can get lost in all, so much of the details. But Paul's unveiling something to us that's absolutely beautiful. And I want us to see that. Hopefully my, my Bible here is messing up. So Ephesians chapter 3. And Paul said, I'm going, to read it, I'm going to read it this way. If you read it straight, you're going to, you're just, you can even kind of follow along in the scriptures, but listen to the way I'm going to read it. Is that by revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. The mystery of Christ. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow members of the body. To bring to light the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's what I believe Paul is saying here, that Paul received a revelation of the mystery that was hidden in God since eternity past. This revelation was a revelation of Christ. But here's what's interesting. We often think the revelation of Christ is only about the person of Jesus, and, and let me explain what I mean by that, but Paul is saying that the revelation of Christ is not only about the person of Jesus, but it's also a revelation of his body. That is also a revelation of Christ, and it's going to become more clear to us as we get in this teaching, but that's what I believe he's saying here, is that specifically the revelation of Christ in Ephesians chapter 3 is a revelation of his body that we are connected to Jesus Christ the head and we are his body having the indwelling life of Jesus Christ in us we give the expression of Jesus Christ together corporately and Paul's telling us that this did not come by by mere information in other words he didn't gather together with the saints in Ephesus and get this revelation. This revelation came to him directly from the Lord, and the Lord was saying, I want you to see the gathering together of the church differently than you presently see this gathering. And what I pray that this class will be is it will be revelationary. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm stealing that word from a friend of mine who edited my book. She used that, that phrase, and I love that phrase is that we would receive a revelation of this, not mere information, not teaching, not doctrine, but it would go further into revelation because that's how Paul got this. It came by revelation. And that this revelation would bring a revolution in how we think about and do church. I know it just a just little bit I've gotten into this has just been life-changing. I've, I've been studying T. Austin Sparks for the last couple of weeks, and this man had insight into what the church is meant to be, unlike anyone probably since Paul, and it has just been impacting me at a, such a deep level. And so I, I just believe that, that God is really going to use this to, to give us revelation. Now, I, I remember I grew up in a denominational church, and I was just thinking about this on the way, to, on the way here, is I grew up in a de denominational church, and my memories of that church, I got a few memories. One of them is a memory of me and the pastor's son in the balcony while his dad or my dad were preaching, and we were acting like we were controlling them on a joystick. <laughs> 
So we were like, you know, taking the joystick and going, okay, move this way, move that way. Just, you know, me and the pastor's kid, okay, blink, press the button, blink, blink, blink. The other memory I have is that when me and my, my uh, friends, we would go to Sunday school and our main goal in Sunday school was to get our Sunday school teacher to laugh because he had this snorky kind of crazy laugh. And so we would always be trying to crack jokes to make him laugh. We had this conspiracy going. We were like, okay, let's see how we can make him laugh because whenever he laughed, it was just crazy laugh. I'm not even gonna try to imitate it because it would sound like a pig. But it was, it was really, really funny. And so we were trying to always get in and say, okay, how can we make him laugh? How can we make him laugh? And so we have no idea what he taught about. I'm not going to say his name in case he ever was to somehow find us on YouTube. But we would just, that we would always plot, okay, say this, say that. And, you know, we would always look at each other and we'd start laughing. We would die laughing. And it was, oh, man, it was funny. Uh, I've changed a lot since then. But another memory that I have of that denominational church is that we gathered together in the parking lot and someone put some masking tape on the parking lot in the form of a body. It looked like a crime scene. And he got, it was this massive outline of a body. And he got everyone in the church to get inside of the body, inside the masking tape. And then they had a helicopter fly over and take pictures of the body looking down. And uh, I was thinking, okay, what on earth? Hopefully that was not dad's idea. <laughs> it was not his idea. But that's kind of what I grew up with thinking the body of Christ was. It was a crime scene in a parking lot with a helicopter taking a picture. And I had no zero revelation of what it meant to be the body of Christ. And I, I got to tell you, that is not what God's plan is for the church. It's just to be this functional or this, this image of this body gathered together with a picture. It, it's so much deeper. The mystery that Paul wants to unveil, the mystery of Christ, his person, his head, his body functioning together in divine life. And so this class, the goal of this class I've got eight goals I want to see accomplished as we teach this. Is number one is that from a place of revelation is to communicate God's eternal purpose of the church. To communicate what, flowing out of God's eternal purpose, what exactly from God's eyes is the church? What does God intend for the church? Who, what, is, what does God have in mind when he purposed the church? Number two is that you would receive a revelation of God's eternal purpose of the church. It's not only what I communicated, but you would get a revelation of it. That, that's my prayer is that we would not get information. We would not just think of it as a, hel a helicopter looking down on this body in masking tape, but we would get a revelation of what God intends for the church. Number three is that receiving this revelation it would bring a revolution to how we view church and do church. Revelationary. A revelation that brings a revolution. Number four, and we talked about this last Sunday, is that we would learn to live by Christ in dwelling life individually. That God would teach us in a much deeper way how to be delivered from being good and doing good in the soul, soul power, to learning to live by the tree of life, learning to live by indwelling life, learning to live by the vine and branch connection and paradigm, that we would learn how individually to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ individually. Number, number five is that we would learn to live by Christ in dwelling life together. That's a big thing for us, is not only do we want to learn to live by the indwelling life of Christ individually, we want to learn to live by his life together in the corporate expression of his life in the earth and to heavenly places, like Paul said in Ephesians 3. That number six, that living by Christ in dwelling life, we would function as an interdependent body 
in divine order. It's very important. God wants us to learn how to function. See, God wants us to learn how, how do we live individually by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ but then, it, you know, it, what I find, it's, it's a lot easier to live from the indwelling life of Jesus Christ individually than it is to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ corporately. Because we all have our own little personality traits, don't we? We all have those things that would, you know, just even in marriage, I do things that drive Angie crazy. You know, one of those is whenever the, the, it starts raining, the, the rain starts coming, and, you know, I turn the windshield wipers on full blast, and I just get off into this zone thinking about something else, and then that, the rain dries up, and there's no rain. And so I still have the windshield wipers going on full blast, and it's screeching on the windshield, and she's like, turn those off. You know, if, you've been, if you're married, you know there are things that drive you crazy about the other person. Now, Angie doesn't do anything that drives me crazy because she's perfect, but... You know, we all have those things in the body that drive us crazy. And so doing life together, living by the indwelling life of Christ together is a whole nother thing that we are learning how to do. And God will use that to bring the cross into our life. This person does this or this person does that. God will use that to crucify our flesh so that we can be living stones fit together. See, God has to do a fitting in of those living stones, just like a construction worker would have to fit the living stones in. We have to do a, a fitting in, which always involves the cross, always involves God's sandpaper, always involves God scrubbing you and, and, and challenging you with other members of the body. That is his divine plan, by the way. God, you know, we think, you know, we can even look at marriage and we think, okay, marriage is the institution of God, and it is, but God sometimes tricks you into it and you realize it's divine, it's the divine way of crucifixion. <laughs> it's not the only thing of marriage, but you would say the same thing about me, I think, while well, you're looking at me like I did something wrong, but the same way in the body. We can never become who God wants us to be apart from the corporate body. And so God has designed it that way. Is that we would learn to live by Christ indwelling life and function as an interdependent body in divine order. Now here's what this is going to mean. Number seven is that the Lord would divide between soul and spirit, Hebrews 4.12, to remove soulish mixture from our corporate expression of Christ indwelling life. See, Hebrews 4.12, that God would divide between soul and spirit. In other words, if we're going to function as a corporate body and express the life of Jesus Christ together, there is a requirement and a necessity for God to bring in the living active word of God and divide between soul and spirit so that we could know what is of the soul and what is of the spirit. What is of our own mind, will, and emotions, and what is prompted by the spirit. And so that is going to be bringing us into greater and greater divine order. And then number eight is that we would have authentic fellowship together with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's uh, John, 1 John chapter 1. Let's, let's turn to 1 John chapter 1 real quick. I love 1 John. I love this statement. It's, it, it, it's such a powerful statement of what John is expressing of what true community is, of what true church life is. And John's revealing this to us in verse 3. And he says, we're proclaiming to you. I'm going to summarize here. He says, we're proclaiming to you the life of Jesus Christ. That his life from eternity came down and was manifested to us. We're proclaiming this to you. And, and he's talking about those who are, he's, he's proclaiming it to those in the church, but also those outside. So we're pro proclaiming the life of Jesus Christ so that you too may have fellowship with us. In the, in the Greek, it's the word koinonia. 
It's a rich word of what is, what is God wants in, in the church, of koinonia, a deep intimacy and communion and partnership and working together and caring for one another. It's really the same thing we see in the relationship of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That unity among the Godhead is to be represented and represented and modeled in the church. It's beautiful that indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, what John is saying is that, is that we have this koinonia fellowship. We have this intimacy with God. We have this deep abiding connection with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that in that relationship with God, vertical, Godward, we would then have the horizontal relationship with the body in the same fellowship with God himself. So, so God wants us all as a body to partake of the intimacy with each other and the intimacy with God as we're pursuing him. Koinonia. That we would have authentic fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But here's the problem. That's, that's the goals of what we want to accomplish in this class but here's the problem, is that we are working with a 1,700-year definition of what church is. Evan and, Evan and Anna were at my, or Anna's always at my house, but Evan was at our house this, <laughs> this past Sunday or this past week. And uh, anyway, I asked him, I said, okay, what, when you tell me, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the word church? And Evan almost immediately said, Ben. And I said, okay, Anna, what do you think of the first, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when, you, when I say the word church? She said, Chloe. So, you know, from the mind of a 10-year-old, the first thing that comes to their mind when you think of the word church is Ben and Chloe. And I asked Anna a couple, a week before that, I said, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word church? And she said, a place where you go to hear a preacher talk about God. See, we have these concepts, these, these ideas of what church is that have been passed down for 1,700 years, and it really is, is difficult for every one of us to break free into the New Testament revelation of what God intended out of his eternal purpose for what the church should be. And so, you know, you think about, you know, let me just ask you for a second, and, and don't cheat. You, you might know the correct answer, but what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the word church? A Sunday school answer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Jesus, Jesus. Absolutely. But see, if, if you think that, if you ask the typical person, what is the church? You know, a lot of people will say it's a place where you go on Sunday. It's a place where you go to hear a message, sing three songs, experience God, you know, talk to your friends, Ben and Chloe, and then afterwards go home and eat a meal, take a nap, and then go back to live your individual Christian life. I mean, that's what so much of what church has become in our day and age. And so others see it as an organization that preaches the gospel and takes care of the poor and establishes justice. But none of these modern day concepts of the church are biblical. Now, there's some elements of it that, that are true. But most of what we now call the church has, has its origins from the mixing of Roman paganism with Christianity when Constantine was the Roman emperor in 300 AD. And so, so often, without even realizing it, because it's just been worked into our culture, worked into our mindset, worked into the way we think church is, we don't even realize that we're actually carrying in this, this idea of what church is from Constantine and when he brought in the, the mixing of Christianity and, and paganism. Now, if you have your notes where it says Constantine, you can start following along now. Constantine was a Roman emperor who ruled between 306 and 337 AD. Now, if you don't know anything about the history of the church, what was happening for the first 300 years of the church is the church was being incredibly persecuted. 
the church was being, in, if, if the church did not bow their knee to Caesar, if they did not give their allegiance to Caesar and bow their knee, the church could be imprisoned, they could be tortured, and ultimately they could be put into death. And some of the death was not very pleasant. Crucifixion, beheading, you know, the worst is being thrown into the Roman Colosseum, and they will unleash hungry lions and bears and boars and and leopards, and you get torn to pieces. So the next time we complain about our TV being struck by lightning and we're under spiritual warfare, okay, just consider we don't really know anything yet. And so Constantine comes in, and he says, okay, now, and supposedly there's a, deb a debate whether he became a Christian or not, but he said, now we are going to make Christianity the, uh, the, uh, he didn't, I don't know if he actually made it the official religion, but we're going to now make Christianity legal. And we're going we're gonna to say there's no more persecution of the church. All of that ceases. And so a lot of the Christians were like, praise God. God has answered our prayer. But what happened is Constantine took the practices of the Greco-Roman world, of the goddess and God worship, and he mixed it in with Christianity and so now they had a blended form of paganism and Christianity. And so without even realizing it, what happened was the living, spontaneous, organic expression of the church who lived by the indwelling life of Christ together as an interdependent body, functioning and representing Christ and showing Christ to the world, all of a sudden then became institutionalized. It became an organic expression of Jesus Christ and his indwelling life, and it became institutionalized and organized under the government of man. And for the next 1,700 years, the church has tried to recover from that blending of paganism and Christianity. Now, the reformers did a lot to, in, in 1517, spearheaded by Martin Luther, to reform the church and recover biblical Christianity. But some of the pagan practices of Rome were still part of the expression of the church, including the order of worship, including the, the way worship was done and, and elaborate church buildings and the separation of the clergy and laity. And, uh, and so the result was that institutional church, rather than that living, organic expression of Christ and his indwelling life, dominated the Christian landscape and has dominated the Christian landscape. And so we are working from a definition and a paradigm, and all of us are affected by this. You know, all of us grew up, and we see it all around us, of what is the church. You go to church. You do a service for two hours. That is church. And we, it, 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 no matter how hard we preach it, and no matter how hard, we, how hard we say it, it's difficult to break free from that paradigm because it's so culturally ingrained to, into us for 1,700 years. But if we want to see what God wants to do here at the end of the age, there is a breaking free of that paradigm that must come by revelation. It's only by revelation we can see what is the church and how is the church supposed to function. I love this quote on uh, point uh, Roman numeral V, what is that, 5, 5, yeah, Roman numeral 5, point C, that when the Greeks got the gospel, they turned it into a philosophy. When the Romans got it, they turned it into a government. When the Europeans got it, they turned it into a culture. And when the Americans got it, they turned it into a business. Isn't that true? Hasn't the church in America become a branded, independent organization that runs and functions like a business. The pastor is the CEO, the elders are the executive leadership team, the worship team are the employees, and the audience who is meant to be the body of Christ comes as a consumer to listen to a message and to hear music for an hour and a half, and then they go home and they do exactly what all consumers do. They give it a rating. It's a five-star rating. Oh, good worship today. Good message today. Five-star rating. You know, probably a couple weeks ago, you would have given me a two-star rating on the message, but that's okay. But we would do whatever consumers would do as an audience as they come to receive entertainment. 
Is that, I mean, isn't that where much of the church is today in America? Not seeing it that we are a body. We are a body who's meant to function together interdependently in divine order. And, and being that body, God wants to bring us into a whole new level. See, for us in America, having 1,700 years of what the church has become, and for us living in a culture of independence, capitalism, free enterprise, and entertainment, it's really, really hard for us to break into this paradigm that the New Testament reveals of what church is. We're still locked in two hours a week, aren't we? We're still locked in to, well, we just come and we gather, we hear a message, we go home and we gather again next Sunday. But the scriptures offer us something so much deeper and something so much richer. And see, here's what I've found. I want, this is really, really important. I, I want to turn, I want us to see this. Well, actually, I don't know if it may not actually be in your notes. But here, here's what's so important here is the American church is made for those who want to fit Jesus into their life. The New Testament church is made for those who want Jesus to be their life. And this is the only way the New Testament church works. See, let me say that again, is the American church is made for those who want to fit Jesus into their life. We want to do enough to get to heaven. We want enough, we don't do enough so our children grow up and live moral lives and live a good life without getting mixed up into drugs or alcohol or whatever it would be or the party lifestyle. We want to do enough for God to bless us. We want to do enough so that God will shine his face on us and give us favor and bless our circumstances, give us a good job, give us a good family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We want to fit Jesus into our schedule. Well, hey, the American church works perfect for that. The New Testament church was never designed to work a fitting Jesus into our life. The New Testament church only works when Jesus Christ is our life. Christ is our life. Our life, we have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. You were crucified to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You were crucified when Jesus died, you died with him. Your old life in Adam died. You've been resurrected with Christ. You now have God's spirit living inside of you. His spirit living inside of you has now joined you to him so that now you live by his life. So now we no longer fit Jesus into our calendar, into our schedule, into what we want to do if it's convenient. Now Christ is our life. And that's the only way the New Testament church can function. It's the only way the New Testament church can work. It's the only way, but it's a beautiful way. I remember, I'm trying to think probably... Almost 20 years ago, a popular book came through the church, and the idea was that church leaders need to establish a vision, and they need to write out the vision, and they need to articulate it in a really simple way, and the problem was, every, you know, this, this, this book spread all throughout the earth, and every church had the same vision statement, basically, and if you thought you were cool and, you know, creative, you would have a little bit of a twist on it to make yours sound a little bit better, but all of them had the same type of a vision statement. And then you were to take that vision statement and you were to then develop processes and strategies of how to achieve that vision statement. Now, I, I drank the Kool-Aid. I got caught up into that. And in our elders meetings, I was trying to push, we need to move in this direction. And the problem is, here's the problem, is you start building a brand of what you want the church to look like, and the Holy Spirit, if he comes in and wants to disrupt your order of service to do it whatever Jesus wants, it really causes you to be disrupted. And so the, Lord, the enemy was trying to use me in this, and we had, I don't know if you remember this, but Noel was ministering, and he knew about this, and I still remember I had a polo shirt on, like a 
a polo cotton shirt, and it was green, army green. I still remember this, 20 years ago. He came to the very back, and he pulled me up. <laughs> For those of you, you know, who know Noel, you can see this. Pulled me up by the collar, and he said, you are not called to build a seeker-sensitive church. You are called to build a church in the spirit of the power of Elijah. And uh, let me just say, if you've ever been offended in church, I can promise you I have, I have an experience that tops that. I was so offended, but he was absolutely right. <laughs> hey, you're the guy that came up with the helicopter and the body. I no, I'm kidding. He was absolutely correct. And, you know, I thank God for that rebuke. We need some good old-fashioned rebukes here and there to get us back on the, cor the correct path. And so the Lord, you know, rescued me from the business organization of what church has become. And what happens is really the church has become, th those that operate by a business really are becoming modern-day towers of Babel. This is good. We, you know, it's good to do this. It's good to do that. Therefore, we need to develop processes and strategies that will cause this good plan to work. And what they don't realize is they're building babbles that make their own names great. And God wants to bring us back to the New Testament functioning of what church is meant to be. Now, you should see under the heading, the New Testament church... I, I, like I said, I've been studying T. Austin Sparks here uh, the past two weeks, and, and this man had incredible insight into the church. And T. Austin Sparks was the first one to use the term organic to describe the New Testament church. I love that word. It's beautiful. Now, I want to read this quote here. He said, God's way in law of fullness is that of organic life. That's beautiful. Organic life. That's how God brings it into fullness. The natural processes of life, Christ indwelling life, released unto fullness. In the divine order, life produces its own organism, whether it be a vegetable, an animal, a human, or spiritual. This is very, this next statement is very important. This means that everything comes from the inside. See, what I was doing way back 20 years ago is I was doing everything from the outside. Vision, strategy, that's the way businesses operate, not the way the church operates. The church operates starting from divine life, the life of Christ, the indwelling life of Christ, that life emanates from the inside out not from the outside in. Does that make sense? You see the difference there? Function, order, and fruit. Now there are, don't, don't misunderstand, there is function, there is order, there is building, there is systems, there is processes, but these don't come from the outside in, they come from the inside out. They issue from this law of life within. It was solely on this principle that we have, what we have in the New Testament, came into being. Organized Christianity has reversed this order. Now, he said that probably 100 years ago or close to 100 years ago. See, the church is a spiritual organism. It's not an institutional organization. The church is God's people, not a building. That's, that's I mean, that might sound simple, but it is powerful. How much of us think church is a building? We drive down the street and we see First Baptist Church, we see First Methodist Church, and we say, that's the church, that's the church, that's the church. That is not the church. And it's so hard, isn't it? It's so hard to break out of that paradigm that we have grown up in and to see the church is not a building, the church is God's people. So it doesn't matter where you meet. Whether you meet in a home, whether you meet in an elaborate building, that does not matter. What matters is that we are God's people. See, what God is building when he's building the church is people. People functioning together based upon divine life. 
from the inside out, functioning and moving together to give expression of who Jesus Christ is in the earth. See, you know, a lot of us have, have moved to eating more organically, where, you know, we want to get away from all the chemicals and the pesticides and all that stuff. In fact, I, you know, we try to do that as much as we can for sure, but we see that or, organic means relating or derived from living matter. The organic church is a church that functions from divine life. The organic church is a church that lives from the inside out, flowing and connecting and expressing Jesus Christ and his life together. See, the organic, organic can also mean having systematic coordination of parts as an, or an organic whole. And so this is really God's vision for the way the church is to function organically by the Spirit of God. See, a lot of churches, if the Holy Spirit was absent, no one would even notice. It would go on and do exactly what it has been doing week after week, month after month, year after year for the last century. No one would even know that the Spirit of God is no longer even in there. For the organic church, however, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move and doesn't show up, we have nothing. But thankfully, he will. But I'm saying we are utterly and totally dependent upon his life. If he doesn't show up, we are in trouble. That's what you see in Acts chapter 2 is the church, the first church, in its rawest expression of what it is meant to be. They were gathered together under the headship of Jesus Christ, called to wait on him, devoted together in prayer, devoted together in him in prayer, and they were waiting on the Lord for God to pour out his spirit. That in, it, that in its simplest form is what church gatherings are to look like. Gathered under his headship, waiting on him, asking him to pour out his spirit, because without his spirit, we have no hope. See, God wants to, for the church to truly be organic, God wants the church, just like in the natural organic fruits and vegetables, that's, you know, if it's not organic, it's contaminated by pesticides or other chemicals. Organic church is meant to be free from soulish mixture, carnal mixture. And we're going to talk about that in one of the sessions, but it's so important because if we don't have the, the soul and the spirit separated, we will quickly become this institutionalized, religious, traditional church that just functions even by, by you know, what we do every single Sunday. See, it's so easy, even in the charismatic church, even in this church, it's so easy that if we as individual members are not living by divine life, living by the life of Christ, throughout the week. It's so easy that we just lock in to the normal order of church. And this is what we do. We sing three songs. I get up and give an exhortation. We take up the offering. I do a message. We go home. It's so easy to get into that. But the, the organic church of the church living by divine life functions and lives by every member living and drawing from the life of Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to John chapter 15, just real quick. Is this making sense? John chapter 15. The Lord talks about the vine and the branches. Now here is what's so interesting. In John 15, the vine and the branches living from the tree of life is the Lord says, he says that in, in, in verse, I want you to see this in verse five. In verses one through four, he's focused on the individual drawing from divine life. In verse five, he's talking about the, the corporate nature. I am the vine, you are the branches. Notice the plural. See, it's not just one branch connected to Jesus divine. It's a multitude of branches connected. See, what God, what, the, what Jesus is picturing for us here in, in John chapter 15 is the corporate expression of individuals fit together, learning to live by indwelling life together. You see that? 
It's the Lord's vineyard. New wine is in the cluster. Isaiah 65. The new wine that God is pouring out is in the cluster. The new wine that God is going to do is coming from the expression of Christ through his body. It's never meant to be just me up here giving expression of Christ's life or the worship team giving expression of Christ's life. It's meant to be the entire body functioning in divine order to give the expression of Jesus Christ and his life in a corporate way. Now, there's obviously the need for order, and we're going to have an entire session about the need for order because without that, it could become chaos very quick. There's a need for the body to function in interdependently in divine order. So now, let's turn, or let's look at defining the church. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. Now this word is derived from ek, out of, and klesis, a calling. So ekklesia, the word we translate church, may not even refer to the body of Christ. It can, but it may not. So ekklesia in the Greek is a body of citizens who are gathered together to discuss the affairs of the estate. It was also used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, to describe Israel and the assembly of Israel. It's also a gathering summoned, a, a gathering summoned for a definite purpose to be a representative of the entire nation. And so when it's applied to Christians, ecclesia is the whole company of the redeemed in the present era and it's the gathering of those who have Christ indwelling life in a given place, like on a Sunday. So it's the global and the local that represents the ecclesia. Now, let's turn now to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, Paul gives us tremendous insight. In fact, I, I believe he's the only one in the New Testament that had the revelation that the ecclesia, those that were called out of the world, those who were called out of the busyness of life to gather together under the headship of Jesus Christ, that Paul saw this not only as a gathering, but he saw it as in this incredibly beautiful way. He saw it as the body of Jesus Christ, the very body of Jesus Christ. It's an incredible revelation that we are members of his body. Together, we are, we are members of his body. Don't just let the, the knowledge stay in your head here. Go beyond that to revelation to see. When we gather together, Randall has the spirit of God in him. Dad and mom and Angie and all of everybody else. We all have the indwelling spirit of God. As we learn to give expression of that life together, we're functioning and flowing as one body together interdependently. It's beautiful. I was reading again, T. Austin Sparks, and he said, if a church is going to gather together to hear a speaker, he said, there's not going to be a lot of spiritual warfare. If a church is going to have a gathering with an evangelist come, there's not spiritual warfare. He said, but when a church gathers together to give a local expression of the body coming into the fullness of Jesus Christ, together, corporately, he said, all hell breaks loose. And what I find, in a strange way, encouragement by that. Because I look at and I see these mega churches out there, and you hardly ever even hear of any spiritual warfare. And I'm thinking, how can we go through the warfare we're going through being a small church and them having this max, massive megachurch never encountering spiritual warfare, I'm like, what is it? And I believe what T. Austin Sparks is hitting on is exactly the reason. The devil's not afraid of a good church service. 
The devil's not afraid of a good sermon. The devil's not even afraid of people getting saved. What terrifies the powers of darkness is when the individual members of the body are coming into fullness. That terrifies hell. That terrifies demonic powers. They want to stop at all costs the corporate expression of Christ coming forth in the individual members unto full maturity. And so they will release everything in their arsenal to attack that. Well, that tells me that's important. That tells me that's exactly what we need to do. That tells me that we have struck a chord, and I praise God that even though I hate the warfare and it stinks, I say that, you know, I praise God that we're doing something right. And if we're doing something right, we need to keep pressing onward and keep pressing inward to see Christ formed in us corporately. So that us having and becoming that representation of Christ in the earth are a microcosm of the global expression of Christ in his body throughout the world. See, Paul is going to give us further definition. He says he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, the ecclesia. This might, I'd have to research this, but I'm pretty sure this might be the first time or one of the first, no, it's not the first time, but Paul is one of the, Paul may be, is the only one, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, is the only one in the New Testament who revealed the ecclesia as the body. Notice what he says, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So this, what, this reverse reveals the following. The church is the body of Christ and is comprised by those who have Christ in them. There is no such thing as the body of Christ apart from those who have Christ in them. And so what we see in America, we see massive churches and we see, you know, who knows exactly how many that Christ actually dwells within, but if Christ does not dwell within a person, that person does not belong to the ecclesia. That person does not belong to Christ and his body. It's only by having the indwelling life of Jesus Christ that we are his body. That's what Paul's saying here. He said that the, the body is the fullness of him who fills all in all. What Paul is saying here is that God's intention is for Christ who dwells in us to possess us fully, individually, and in doing that individually, when we come together and are fit together as living stones, then the corporate expression of all of the branches living from the, the, the vine, Jesus Christ, all of that together then brings forth the fullness of Jesus Christ. See, there's an obligation on us. There's an obligation on us. And Paul said, my brethren, that we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We are under obligation to live by the Spirit of God. That if any of you are in the flesh, you need to put, you're under obligation. You have a responsibility to put to death the deeds of the body so that you can live. See, we have a responsibility. Church, your responsibility as the body is not to just show up to church once a week. Your responsibility is to live in the fullness of Jesus Christ Monday through Saturday. Now, we're not going to do that perfect. No one is. But that is your responsibility. And see, God wants to change us. We think, okay, I'm just going to live my life and come to church this two hours on Sunday as an attender, God wants to change that paradigm to we say we are living by the indwelling life of Christ throughout the week, and now when we come together, we have a responsibility. 
to function and flow together as one body. See, this is what, this is what church is all about. See when, we begin to, see, when we begin to function this way, we become a representation of Christ in Marietta. That's what we want. We want the mature man to come forth in this place, the body of individual members having the fullness of Christ in them individually. Now think about that. When we get connected to each other, we then have the fullness of Christ corporately. Now, it's not the complete fullness of Christ, for sure, but we become a living, breathing expression of Jesus Christ in Marietta. That's what God is jealous for. He is jealous for his son. He is not jealous for us to have a nice service, a two-hour meeting where we hear a good message and sing good music. Have some moving of the Spirit. God is jealous for Christ to be formed in his people. Paul was in labor that Christ would be formed in the Galatians. The forming of Christ inside of us, and then from that formation of Christ inside of us, the flowing outward of his divine life is what, this, is what church is meant to be. So, in short, the ecclesia is a people who are called out of the world and the busyness of life to an assembly, to a gathering like this. And together, they gather under Christ's headship and express his life as an interdependent body. I don't know about you, but this is beautiful to me. I'm jealous to see us here at Restoration Life move into this at such a deep level. Every one of us learning to function together. This is, this is what church is meant to be. I'm jealous for that. I, I'm so jealous for this to happen. I, I can't settle just to have a normal tradition. I mean, we, we've had great services in the past, and we will continue to have great services, but God wants something more than just a good service. God wants this body moving into the fullness of Jesus Christ individually and then corporately and giving expression of his life. See, all of us have different personalities and different expressions and different revelation and different talents and gifts that the Lord wants to bring under the reign of his spirit and, and learn to express that corporately so that this given, uh, this given church in this uh, city could represent him, like it says in Ephesians chapter 3, to the powers and principalities in heavenly places. I'm going to go into that next Sunday, but that the church is meant to be that representation of him. Let's talk about, for a second, Jesus Christ being the head. See, when we talk about the church, the first thing we have to understand is Jesus Christ is the head. He's the head of the church. You, if you cut off your head, you're basically, obviously, going to die. Because the head, that's a, hey, that's a, if you didn't get any revelation today, that right there is revelation. If you cut the head off, you'll die, okay? So you don't say you didn't get any revelation. There it is right there. That Jesus Christ is the head and we are his body. See, and, and so we're, we're gather, when we gather together, we're not gathering together under, uh, you know, we're, we're gathering together under the headship of Jesus Christ. We want to we receive from his life. We want to receive from his indwelling life. We want to move by the Spirit of God together. Just as the head gives direction and the head gives nourishment and the head gives life and the body then expresses the life and, the, and the, the direction from the head, we have the mind of Christ. And that's just not an individual thing, that's corporate. The nervous system, the way the nervous system works in our natural bodies is the way God moves by the head. We had a situation in our house where we lost, our lightning struck and a plug went out and it messed up our internet 
for a couple days, and I felt like I was, couldn't do anything. You know, my whole life depends on the cloud. My whole life depends on this connection now. And I got to thinking, you know, that's really the way the church is meant to function. We each, you know, just, just as we, you know, we each are connected to the cloud. We're connected to the internet. And through the internet, we can then connect with each other, Facebook or email or WhatsApp or FaceTime or whatever it would be. But without that cloud, without that connection, we cannot connect. It's the same with the body. We are rightly connected to the head, and only when we're connected to the head can the body then function together in a connected, related way. Now, I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. is an incredible statement. Paul is talking here. He's talking about the body. Now he's, now he's using the body, the physical human body, as an analogy. And he's saying, even as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. Listen to what he says. So also is Christ. Christ, the head, and Christ, the body. You see that? We are literally bone of his bone. We are members of his body. And that does not mean Jesus, doesn't have, Jesus in heaven does not have a physical body. He does. But we are the expression of his life in the earth. Think about that. Acts chapter 1, Luke's writing. This is incredible. Luke says, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Because now he was transitioning from Jesus of Nazareth and he was going into heaven and he was pouring out his spirit to, into the body so that now only what Jesus had done in the New Testament, in the Gospels, now the, by the time you get to the book of Acts, it was only the beginning of what he had done and taught. That now as the body carrying the life of Jesus Christ, we are to carry on the expression of his life in the earth. As we gather, where we go, wherever we go, giving expression of his body. This is beautiful. How beautiful is this that the body is Christ? See, in and, and, and the parable of the, of the sheep and the goats, Jesus is talking and he says, he says, you visited, you visited me in prison. I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. And like, when did we do this? He said, whenever you did it to one of these least of these. Because his body is him. He told Saul, who was persecuting him, he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus. Saul was persecuting the church, the ecclesia. Yet to Christ, it was his very body. And he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, this is, I mean, just incredible. When we get a revelation of this and we learn to function in divine order, we learn to function interdependently, we're, we're learning how to function together as one body. Just think about how beautiful this will be in the corporate expression of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we bring this to a close, I believe what I, what I sense the Lord wanting to do is I think God wants to bring us to an entirely new level of flowing and operating together as one corporate body. I believe God is going to bring us to an entirely new level of glory functioning together out of divine life. And I am so excited about that. Now, I've realized that I have, no, I have not given much teaching on, okay, how do we do this? How do we function together in order? How do we function 
as a body interdependently. And so I'm going to be doing this in this series, and we'll have some practical teaching where we learn more and more how to function and, and how to be in divine order and things like that. And so I believe God is going to take us to an entirely new level. I think where the Lord's bringing us is beautiful. It is an incredible thing what God is going to do corporately over these next three to four months as we teach through this. I, I believe we are never going to be the same. It'll, I believe it will be revelationary. The revelation bringing the revolution into how we see and do church. Amen? Amen. Well, let's, let's pray.